Um, so Dr. Yader, we could go to the next slide. Um, today we are joined by Dr. Deirdre Yader. Um, she is a professor at Sacred Heart University and her title officially has the most big words of any DCP webinar to date. Um, but she is going to break down these fancy terms for us. Um, investigations and executive function in dolphins, violation of expectations and delayed gratification, or an exploration in an area of dolphin cognition. Um, so feel free to keep those questions coming and we will ask them at the end. Um, so I will turn it over to you, Dee. Okay. Well, thank you very much for having me today. Um, and as you can see, um, I'm part of the Comparative Psychology Lab at Sacred Heart University, um, along with my colleague, Dr. Don Melzer, who is a developmental psychologist. So I'm going to talk first about what is comparative psychology. And so this is basically the study of evolutionary and developmental basis of behavior. So we're basically comparing non-humans to human behavior. Um, and we're looking at information processing across various species, including humans. So the field of comparative psychology, when looking at animals, we often draw information from studies with pre-verbal infants. So yes, this is an exploration today in an area of dolphin cognition. So dolphin cognition um, is a huge topic. Um, basically, dolphins are known you know, to be highly intelligent. Most people know oh, dolphins, I've heard they're pretty smart, right? So dolphin cognition is the study of kind of their intelligence. It's, um, we there have been many studies that have been done in managed care and like a laboratory type setting, but also investigations in the wild. And some of these um, dolphin cognition topics that you may be familiar with might include the studies of social behavior, play, communication, you know, all of these maybe through DCP you've heard about. Um, the study of language at Koala Basin Marine Mammal Lab was a big dolphin cognition laboratory um, looking at language and understanding communication with dolphins. Um, cooperation is another task that's been looked at in dolphins. Tool use, here I have examples. Um, the photos show in the wild as well as in a managed care setting. And imitation, again, also evidence in both the wild and in captivity. So dolphin cognition is not always just um, in the laboratory. It can be studied in the wild as well. And there are many different topics, but today I'm going to just focus on a few that I've been working on. Um, so the area that I'm going to talk about today is dealing with executive functions. So basically executive functions, we're looking at higher level cognitive skills that you use to control and coordinate your other cognitive abilities and behaviors. So executive functions regulate your, and they help control your thoughts and your actions. So this is a big area that psychologists study in human cognition, but there's much to learn still about executive function and how it develops in children. Um, and we're just been beginning to explore these topics in non-human species, such as dolphins. So some of the topics that are investigated when looking at executive functions with humans would be attention, planning, inhibition, cognitive flexibility, reasoning, problem solving, initiation, monitoring, and memory. So today I'm going to talk about a few of the projects that I've um, worked on collaboratively with other amazing researchers, including DCP. And the first series of studies I'll be talking about briefly will be um, looking at discrimination and visual laterality. So I'll, I'll break down, I'll talk a little bit more about that term in a minute but we're going to be talking about different types of stimuli that are presented to animals. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about a violation of expectation research paradigm. It's basically like looking at something that's unexpected or surprising. So I'll talk a little bit more about that. And there are three species that we studied, bottlenose dolphins, Pacific white-sided dolphins, which I'll also use the term lags, which is um, based off of their scientific name. It's kind of like a nickname. And then belugas. I'll also talk about curiosity, which was studied using violation of expectations as well. I'll talk more about that with bottlenose and rough tooth dolphins. And then finally, delayed gratification and inhibition, which I mentioned was one of those big areas for executive function in bottlenose dolphins. So laterality, when I use that term, what am I talking about? It's the hemispheric specialization 
when we're processing certain types of information. So you see the picture of the brain, the two hemispheres are the two sides of the two halves of the brain. So each hemisphere has some specialized um, processing for our cognitive abilities when we're looking at different tasks. So why is this advantageous to be able to process information in different hemispheres of the brain? So basically this may allow for more efficient cognitive processing. It may allow for multiple cognitive processes to be working at the same time. And if it's advantageous for survival, then most individuals should show similar hemispheric functioning. Okay, so in the literature, there is some evidence for lateralization in cetaceans, so dolphins, whales. Um, lateralized behavior has been pretty well documented. So some examples you may be familiar with would be like um, swimming patterns, certain circle swimming patterns maybe, foraging patterns, um, like on the mud flats, maybe using always one side or one eye when foraging. Um, another example uh, might be the swim position that mom calves take and what side the calf is usually found on. So this has been you know, pretty well studied, but just recently it's been indicated for people interested in cognition why this might be important in terms of processing information in the brain. Um, so basically when we look at cetaceans, their eye placement and their brain structure makes them a perfect candidate to study visual lateralization. So when, from now on, if I say visual lateralization or laterality, just think about eye preference. And this is due to the fact that there's this complete crossing in the optic nerve and the optic chiasm in the brain of the cetaceans. So therefore, what this basically means is there's an eye preference. Whatever is seen by the right eye, that information is processed in the left hemisphere of the brain and vice versa. So whatever is seen then in the left eye is processed in the right hemisphere of the brain. So what are some possible explanations for using different eyes or different hemispheres of the brain? And one hypothesis has to do with novelty. So this theory suggests that the right eye or the left hemisphere should process something that would be novel threatening or surprising. So there's an advantage to using the right eye and the left hemisphere when processing these types of stimuli. The other hypothesis or explanation might be the social hypothesis. This suggests using your left eye and the right hemisphere would be important if you're understanding social stimuli. So in the literature, there's some evidence that discrimination um, between different types of stimuli is important to cetaceans. So yes, dolphins have been found to be able to distinguish between familiar and unfamiliar stimuli when presented with things that are familiar or unfamiliar, novelty. How is this usually measured? In gaze duration or looking time? So also in the literature, there have been um, some studies looking at uh, visual investigations of the dolphins and cetaceans. So dolphins have been shown to visually inspect unfamiliar humans longer than familiar. And they also have shown this left eye preference when looking at something that's familiar or unfamiliar. So if they're using their left eye and the right hemisphere of their brain, sorry, um, then this could be the social theory, right? This could support the social theory. So this study is conducted by Thielgis et al. And I'll talk about that again in a minute. Also, when looking at objects, um, the dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, were able to look at unfamiliar objects longer, so they could discriminate. Therefore, it was evidence for discrimination between unfamiliar and familiar objects. And also, they showed a right eye preference um, for this. So this led us, of course, my studies I mentioned were collaborative. I worked in collaboration with Dr. Heather Hill from St. Mary's University. And our basically a research team of us worked on a multi-institutional, multi-species program. We replicated and extended those recent studies I just mentioned in which dolphins were tested for their ability to visually discriminate between familiar and unfamiliar humans and objects. Uh, we investigated the animals um, that you see here listed at um, SeaWorld, Mystic, and Shed. We had um, um, investigated all of those animals, their representational capacities, 
by assessing their representations to surprising events, again, related to both human stimuli and object stimuli. Okay, so based on that work in the literature by Thielgis et al, we kind of replicated that study that was conducted with bottlenose dolphins, and we did this with belugas and the Pacific white-sided dolphins, or the lags. This was published in 2014 in Animal Cognition. Um, and again, this, the animals that we studied were at Mystic Aquarium and SeaWorld San Antonio. For us, for our series of studies that I collaborated with Dr. Hill, this was um, basically our pilot study just with these new species. Uh, then we moved on and we did um, an extension using three species. This time we included bottlenose dolphins. We looked at beluga's bottlenose and Pacific white-sided dolphins or lags. This was published in the Journal of Comparative Psychology in 2016. And in this extension, we added some extra variables. So we had the familiar versus unfamiliar humans that was similar. Um, in this case, the familiar humans were the trainers that had worked with the animals for over, more, over a year. Um, and then the unfamiliar stimuli or the unfamiliar people, humans, those were guests or visitors to the aquarium. We also um, manipulated the activity level of the person because initially the person was just standing there neutral. Um, but really trainers never stand there without moving in front of their animals. Usually dolphin trainers are very active um, and reinforcing to their animals socially by being active and kind of more um, hands-on and playful. So we added activities like peekaboo, crazy hands, jumping jacks, and marching when we presented our stimuli. Um, and then finally, we varied the clothing. One of the criticisms of the earlier work was that um, these animals, dolphins, cannot differentiate between faces of a familiar and an unfamiliar person. And it's all based on the clothing they're wearing. And they only recognize their trainers because maybe they're wearing a wetsuit or a uniform. Um, and we wanted to look into this. So we had everyone wear a, a standardized t-shirt. Uh, we expected for our hypotheses, we thought that the animals would look longer at a neutral, unfamiliar human. We also expected they would look longer at the active, familiar human, like I mentioned, more similar to a dolphin trainer. And we also expected um, that there would be no difference in their gaze duration, that really this clothing type doesn't matter and there's something else they're recognizing for familiarity of their trainer. Um, we also thought, hey, there's probably going to be an eye preference if we're thinking there's this lateralization or brain hemisphere that's uh, more dominant when looking at these familiar or unfamiliar stimuli. Okay, so here, this um, is just showing you what our apparatus was, our methods. We used an opaque curtain in front of underwater viewing windows. It was a free swim scenario, which means that basically the animals in this picture, you can kind of see the beluga, they were able to just swim around at their own and come and investigate whatever we present in front of the curtain on their own. They're not reinforced with fish by a trainer to do so. They're not being told to come look at the stimuli. They just are swimming around. They come over and investigate on their own. Um, we set up the curtain many times without presenting any stimuli. This was just to desensitize the animals to make sure that it wasn't just the curtain that was interesting to them. Um, when we put the human in front of the curtain, we had the human in front of the curtain for one minute, and then we took them out again. They kind of um, uh, secretly went through this passageway here. It's a little bit open, but usually it would be tightly closed. Um, and then in between trials, there was about five minutes where there was nothing happening, right? So they're kind of habituated now to the curtain, and they're just att uh, attending to that stimuli that's presented in front of the curtain. The, um, all of the study sites, the only one where the animals viewed the stimuli above the surface of the water were the bottlenose dolphins at the world of San Antonio. And so um, I just showed you a picture of the underwater viewing windows with the mystic belugas. Um, here, all of the, the belugas at the world of San Antonio also viewed in underwater viewing windows. And here, both sets of Pacific white-sided dolphins or lags also viewed at the underwater viewing windows, the curtain. 
So here's an example of one of the trials. And you can see there'll be an unfamiliar person coming through the curtain in just a second. He is um, wearing the standardized t-shirt. So he's a guest at the aquarium and he's going to be doing some active behaviors. And you can see this is one of the belugas, Juno. He comes over and takes a look. He's doing peekaboo, he opens his mouth. Maybe he's surprised. We would be counting how many seconds the Juno, the beluga, is looking with which eye, and we'd be recording that. He swims out of view now, so we wouldn't count this anymore. We wouldn't be recording it, even though this person, this um, stimulus of the unfamiliar person is still in front of the window. I don't think he swims back again in this, in this video here. I think he goes and he plays with his friend in the Luark. <laughs> okay, so what were some of the um, conclusions? Basically here we thought, yes, the animals did exhibit longer gaze durations for unfamiliar people. So as we expected, they looked longer at unfamiliar people, but however, there was a species difference. So the belugas looked the longest, then the dolphins and the lags, the Pacific white-sided dolphins looked the quickest, the shortest amount of time. Um, the animal did prefer to look longer when their people were more active, and there was no real difference between clothing types. So that supported what we had initially thought. There was something else they were recognizing for familiar people, their trainers, versus just what clothing they were wearing. All right, so then when we look at eye preference or laterality, um, we found that the, well, it wasn't quite as clear cut, <laughs> but we did find Yes, the, the belugas and the legs, we thought they were gonna show this left eye preference because they're human stimuli, they're social stimuli. And yes, for familiar people, they did show a left eye preference for the mystic belugas and the serial San Antonio and the shed lags, the Pacific white-sided dolphins. So yeah, that did support the social hypothesis like we expected. However, maybe um, for the serial San Antonio, uh, um, belugas and dolphins, there was this right eye preference. So maybe that suggests the novelty hypothesis. So again, like we just saw in the literature before how there were some discrepancies. Again, we found the same thing in this study, not quite as clear cut for eye preference as we had hoped. So when we showed the unfamiliar stimuli, they had a right eye preference for some of the animals and a left eye pre preference for some of the animals. So is it the social hypothesis or the novelty hypothesis? What we determined and what we really investigated in this paper were the fact that the individual differences or individual animal personalities may play a role in which eye they're using to investigate the stimuli. Okay, that takes us to our next study, which was exactly the same, the same setup with the curtain only now instead of presenting familiar and unfamiliar humans, we're presenting unfamiliar and familiar objects. So the familiar objects were um, enrichment toys that the animals interacted with a lot that were safe to leave in their pools. So they were very highly familiar with them. The trainers picked out what they listed as being familiar. And then the unfamiliar objects were similar in size and shape and we kind of brought them in from home. <laughs> um, in this study, we um, looked at unfamiliar and familiar objects with the belugas, Pacific white-sided dolphins, and the bottlenose dolphins. This was uh, published in Animal Cognition in 2017. And some of these findings were that yes, um, as we predicted, they did look longer at unfamiliar objects rather than familiar. So they were more intrigued by those surprising unusual events like different um, objects that we brought in that they weren't used to seeing in front of the window and um, we also found the same thing about a species difference so there were longer gaze durations exhibited by the belugas and then the bottlenose dolphins and significantly shorter um, gaze durations or looking times for those pacific white-sided dolphins or the lags um, the next paper Again, the same setup with the objects, only this time we were looking at eye preference or laterality. This was published in International Journal of Comparative Psychology in 2017. We found here that the animals did prefer to view both types of objects with both eyes. That was the belugas especially, they tended to come straight at the window and look with both eyes 
kind of rotate their eyes forward and really stare at the objects. Um, when they used one eye, belugas preferred the left eye. And then on the other hand, bottomless dolphins tended to view the objects, both familiar and familiar, with the right eye. And then the lags, the Pacific white-sided dolphins, tended to use their left eye when viewing the objects. So again, it wasn't clear cut. There were species differences for this laterality or eye preference. So which hemisphere of the brain they might be using. Okay, and here's a video that's going to show the same experimental setup, only now it's with an unfamiliar object. And we had a table set up in front of the curtain. Again, this is very similar to how they would study human infants. And this is unfamiliar. It's actually my kid's hockey helmet. So Juno has never seen this before. He looks like he's coming right over. You can see he's kind of looking with both eyes. We would be measuring how many seconds he's looking. The Luark is coming over. Oh, they might be going off to do something social now. <laughs> But you kind of get the idea. Um, I'll come back to this example a little bit later as I'm explaining the next stage of the study. So the next part of the study, we introduced this surprise paradigm that I mentioned, the violation of expectations. So VOE, violation of expectations. This is um, an experimental paradigm that's based on developmental research with kids, right? So six months old infants, they can keep track of up to three hidden objects. Um, so when objects are shown, infants form an expectation of what they think is going to happen, then they can retain the identity of that object in their brain, right, behind a hidden screen. And then when that object, uh, that expectation, what they think is going to happen is violated, they look longer, their gaze time increases. So again, gaze duration or looking time is really important in understanding that they show a differentiation between um, the stimuli. So in violations of expectations, we're looking at an individual's, animals or human child's expectation about the world, and it's revealed via allocation of attention, it's looking time. Animals might look longer at unexpected trials. We think violations, something they don't expect, rather than expected. And this might include if we show an unexpected control, which means like they expect to see something again and then nothing is there, nothing's there. Um, so that's kind of this little picture and I'm gonna show you guys an example here um, that's commonly used with human infants. And this is the solidarity principle. So at 11 months of age, usually infants will be able to understand this solidarity principle. So you'll see here, that objects shouldn't be able to transfer through another solid object. So they understand basically, we can't walk through a wall. Surprise, right? So it went through the wall. Um, before I get to that, I guess I wanted to also mention on our studies, so this violation of expectation with the same exact paradigm I've been talking about um, with the humans and the objects presented in front of the curtains at the underwater viewing windows. What we did was we put out that same hockey helmet and then maybe after a minute, we took the hockey helmet out and put out either the same hockey helmet or changed it up and put a familiar object out there. Um, or maybe we changed it up and put a trainer out there, a human. Um, so therefore, we were able to kind of mix up uh, and violate their expectations. We had all the different um, you know, ways to manipulate this, familiar or unfamiliar object or human. And this study is currently under review and hopefully will be published soon. So stay tuned for more about that violation of expectation um, project that's based on the other two I just showed you. But this is going to take me to another violation of expectation study looking at dolphins. Um, and they're using violations of expectations to investigate curiosity. And this was conducted by Dr. Malin Lilly. 
for her uh, doctoral dissertation at the University of Southern Mississippi, and I was a member of her doctoral committee. And she published this article in International Journal of Comparative Psychology in 2018. And maybe some of you had the chance to read it before today's talk. Um, and if you have specific questions for Dr. Lilly, I put her email address at the top here. Um, also, I'll try and answer questions at the end, but I also included her email just in case you had questions, I know, because some of you read the article. Um, so her study was conducted at Gulf World Oceanarium, which was, is in Panama City, Florida. And she studied bottlenose dolphins and rough tooth dolphins. And she did two different experiments. The first was a surprising event, a jack-in-the-box. And the second was a violation of expectation, um, a little bit different than our curtain experiment where things were coming in, in front of or behind the curtain. In this case, it was an object transformation, which I'll, ex I'll explain in a second. And she again used the underwater viewing windows to collect the data. Um, so in her first experiment, there was um, a control object, which was a basic cylinder, stationary, didn't do much. The second object was the jack-in-the-box, which was the experimental object, and it had this surprise element to it. Everyone's familiar with the jack-in-the-box where it pops up. Um, she analyzed her data looking at which individuals came over. Again, it was a free swim scenario. The animals were not reinforced by getting fish for participating and looking at objects. They just swam by and came and investigated on their own. Um, she measured gaze duration or looking time. Again, which eye they were using to investigate the stimuli. Also, things like bubble burst, bubble trails, open mouth, and startle responses. Since these, the startle or the flinch, all of these things might indicate curiosity or surprise. So in the second experiment, she looked at these object transformations. If you can see um, on the left side of the screen, she had a tube with a hidden panel. And here um, in the first transformation, she would drop an object down the tube and according to gravity, right, we would expect the same object to come out the bottom of the tube. So that was the first transformation. That was the control. That was what was expected, right? You put one object in, the same object should come out as it's falling down the tube. But because there's this hidden panel, we can, experimenters can do a little magic, right? Just like what happened with the car rolling down the hill that we watched in the video. So in this case, the second transformation, she put an object into the tube, but nothing came out of the bottom. So again, that would be an example of unexpected or unexpected control. And then finally, the last transformation would be if she put one object in the top of the tube and a different object, whoa, came out the bottom of the tube, right? So that would definitely be unexpected. And we would um, hypothesize that the animals might look longer at something that's surprising or unexpected using this research paradigm. Okay, so in her first experiment with the jack-in-the-box, yes, moving objects seem to be more interesting to animals. So that, you know, met what she was expecting. Also, in terms of curiosity, she was able to look at the open mouths. I, I, you saw that before in the video with, with Juno as well, the open mouth. This is common with aggression, but there was no documented jaw claps or S posturing or anything like that. So therefore, it might be associated with surprise. Um, she also looked at bubble bursts and bubble um, startle responses. And the bubble bursts show that maybe it was playful or excitement or, again, surprise. Um, there's not much in the literature at all about the startle response. So Malin was basically one of the first people, Dr. Lilly was maybe one of the first people to look at the startle or the flinch response in the animals um, and using this as a way to measure surprise or excitement. Um, then when she looked at the violation of expectations with the tube, with the hidden panel, she didn't find a uh, violation of expectation differences. So maybe it's just this movement or the presence of the object. Um, it could be they're not able to interact with the objects because they're seeing them through a window or an underwater viewing window. They can't use their echolocation. So, um, the violation of expectation isn't as clear cut. And finally, she did find there were large variations between individual dolphins. So it's hard to generalize how they're responding 
um, as a group and two species of dolphins where there was individual variation in the responses. So that was for the gaze duration or the surprise violation of expectation, the looking time part of the paradigm. Now, hot off the presses, um, Dr. Lilly just published uh, this article in the International Journal of Comparative Psychology in 2020. And she used again rough tooth dolphins, bottlenose dolphins, but this was now looking at the um, laterality or eye preference component to the curiosity research. Again, using those same violations of expectations. So here she found that yes, the bottlenose dolphins did display uh, an overall right eye preference, and really they had this preference for unpredictable moving stimuli. Um, especially if they tended to be unfamiliar stimuli. The rough tooth dolphins didn't show a clear cut eye preference. Um, she didn't find any significant correlations between laterality and behavioral interest with the stimuli. And only the bottlenose were correlated for laterality or eye preference and the curiosity ratings for personality. So um, basically this eye preference research, there's still more work to be done. It's an exciting area hopefully trying to indicate using this violation of expectation paradigm, how um, these animals are using their brains to um, discriminate and understand their world. The next part of um, this talk, I'm going to focus on a different area of executive function. I'm going to be talking about inhibition and delayed gratification. So in this case, um, executive functions to remind you, we were talking about higher order thinking, flexibility of thought, planning, and this does include the ability to de delay one's gratification. So from a developmental point of view, children are able to delay gratification. If they can do this, they tend to have more positive outcomes academically, they're better at problem solving, they have a, a more positive mental health, and then later in their life, they tend to be more successful in careers and relationships. So I'm going to show you guys this brief video on the marshmallow task, which is done uh, um, by a developmental psychologist looking at children and their ability to delay gratification. They're given in a laboratory setting a marshmallow. The experimenter says, I need to leave the room for a minute. Um, but when I come back, if you don't eat the marshmallow, I'll promise I'll give you a second marshmallow. So you can get another marshmallow if you wait until I get back instead of eating that marshmallow. So don't eat the, don't touch that marshmallow. I'll be right back and you'll get a second one. So let's take a peek at this video. Okay, so you can see that the kids here are just maybe using different strategies. So developmental psychologists are really interested in how are the children able to delay their gratification? Younger kids are impulsive and they just go ahead and eat that marshmallow as soon as the experimenter leaves. Um, but older kids, how does this develop? How are they able to um, figure out how to delay their gratification and inhibit that natural response to like eat it immediately? So basically, are they singing to themselves? Are they talking to themselves? Are they looking away from the marshmallow? Do they kind of nibble at it? Do they lick the marshmallow? Do they um, close their eyes? You know, so there are many different strategies. And so far in the literature, there's some evidence that animals tend to be impulsive and maybe they prefer small or immediate rewards. However, there has been some research done with primates that shows that they can inhibit their eating quantities. So same thing, maybe they can wait for the larger reward later. And this is basically what we're trying to study, looking at delayed gratification. Again, this is a collaborative effort um, with Dr. Kathleen Dzinski, Dr. Heather Hill, Dr. Don Melzer, Dr. Lauren Heifel, and myself. We're looking at um, impulsivity versus self-control, looking at delayed gratification using tokens, or in this case, symbols. And we're studying bottomless dolphins at Blue Lagoon, which is Dolphin Encounters, in Nassau, Bahamas. So here you can see the Dolphin Encounters training staff, including Annette Dempsey and Tashala Clark, um, are working with four different dolphins. Initially, two males and two females were tested. And the two different symbols indicated different quantities of reward. 
So we had the circle symbol, which was indicating one fish, and the star symbol, which was indicating many fish. So our initial research now is looking at the testing for preference. Do dolphins prefer many fish, or do they prefer that immediate reward of one fish? So we don't know what the preference is, right? In terms of kids, we assume, oh, they want more marshmallows, right? More is better than just one marshmallow. Two marshmallows is better than one or two cookies, whatever you want to think of your extra, think of what your favorite reward is. <laughs> um, so here, this is um, kind of an example of the um, training. So the star alone would indicate a jackpot that's on the left-hand side of your screen of eight fish, so many fish, that's a lot of fish for the dolphin. Or if they are shown the circle, they just get one fish. So they're kind of learning what these symbols mean, what do the tokens give them in terms of a reward. And then the test for the preference is to show both symbols at the same time and which symbol does the dolphin choose on their own without being told. So it doesn't matter which one they choose, they'll get some reward for either one. They'll get a one fish or the jackpot. So they need to consistently show that they really want that jackpot if that's their preference. We're not sure if that's their preference. Do they prefer many fish, many capelin over um, belly rubs or over some other reward? That's what we're working on kind of right now. Um, the second phase of this research will implement that delay. So once we know for sure that they are interested in a jackpot or some preferred reward, then when we know that's what they're continuously selecting, we're going to create an unequal contingency, meaning maybe the one fish or the circle will mean immediate reward, whereas the jackpot or the star symbol would indicate a delayed reward, but you get more, you get more fish in this case. So stay tuned for this DCP collaboration. I'm sure there'll be more to come, interesting, exciting, but that's where we are currently um, with the task, with the research. And then finally, I wanted to mention that Sacred Heart University, um, we have a new canine cognition project. So I work on this in collaboration with Dr. Dawn Melzer, again, the comparative psychology lab. She's the developmental psychology side of things, whereas I'm more the comparative animal person. And we're recruiting dogs and their owners to participate in research in our laboratory on campus. So currently we're testing violations of expectations and the exact same paradigm that I showed you earlier, where dogs, we're hoping, will understand object permanence and violations of expectation with that rolling car going down behind a screen and the impossible event of going through the wall. So if you know anyone in Connecticut or if you live nearby, contact me if you have a dog and your dog can participate in fun cognitive tasks on campus with us. Um, and I, I don't have, um, I guess I don't have any other exciting news. This is where I'm going to leave off, but thank you for listening. And if there are any questions, uh, maybe Kel will help me find out. <laughs> yes. Um, we'll do our little wrap up first and then we will um, get to everyone's questions. Um, so a reminder to folks that our webinars are recorded so you can find them in two places. You can find them on our website under that education tab. That's also where the upcoming schedule is posted and you can also find them on YouTube Clever Dolphin Communication Project. Um, our upcoming programs include next Tuesday, um, our dolphin lesson is on Tuesday and it's geared towards younger students. Um, and I'm going to be joined by a shark researcher and we're gonna ask the kids if we're allowed to be friends. If I study dolphins and she studies sharks, can we even get along? Um, and along the way, we'll compare and contrast uh, the two. And then next Thursday, we have another DCP dives deep and Dr. Dudzinski is going to be sharing um, lots of her work with studying dolphin pectoral fin contact. Um, and we can progress, D, to the, I think maybe already the last slide. Um, we also have the dolphin pod, so that's available on our website or wherever you get your podcasts. Um, very funny and educational. And then lastly, um, last slide, 
Of course, we would be a bad nonprofit if we didn't remind you that you can support us. Um, so there are lots of ways that you can support us. Um, of course, things like field courses and eco tours are on hold for the moment, but they will be back someday. Um, and right now we're, we've tried to find out a way to, that we can give back, right? We, we can't make masks. We, we don't know what we could do, but for every $15 that folks spend on those starred things on our website, adopt a dolphin, get a t-shirt, get a headband bandana, um, for every $15 you can choose someone to receive a free electronic adopt a wild dolphin kit. So that can be an essential worker that you wanna say thank you to. It can be someone in your life who you feel like is having a hard time right now. Um, we've given away quite a few already and we look forward to giving away an unlimited number of them. Um, and then that's of course, all the ways you can stay in touch with us, our website, email, social media. Um, so keep, we're gonna get to your questions for Dr. Yader, but of course, um, stay in touch with us all the time. So thank you. Um, D, we have um, new questions coming in as well, but we'll get to some of the earlier ones. Two were related to the eye preference. Um, so one was about when dolphins are sleeping, um, do they simply rotate the eyes that are open versus closed, uh, which hemisphere of the brain is resting, or do they have kind of preference there as well? Um, I'm not sure if they have a preference, but I do know that when they are resting, the, the, who they're with are always on the side of their eye that's open, right? So the, if there's a mom with a calf, the calf would tend to always be on that same side. So when we're talking about the social hypothesis, we would think, we would think that the other conspecifics would be on that side where the eye would be open. Um, I am not sure as in terms of the sleep, I guess. If, yeah. if they have a preference for sleeping, I think both hemispheres would need rest. Yeah. That's what I would think too, that they would, even if they had a preference, the preference wouldn't win <laughs> if they had to rest both hemispheres. Um, related to dolphins facing their trainer, the images that we see, the dolphin is kind of looking at the trainer head on. Um, if a dolphin has an eye preference, um, for familiar objects or novel things, do they ever turn their eye to receive yes. that new cue or a, a cue that they're very familiar with? Yes, so in the videos that I showed you as well were belugas, so it's a little bit different for the dolphins. For sure the dolphins were more apt to swim around in front of the window using one eye slowly. Um, the, the different animals, you know, is at Mystic Aquarium, well, oftentimes they did come straight on, but at other facilities that we studied, they would come and look with one eye or the other. They might actually physically be sitting in front of there and turning their head mm -hmm. while investigating. Um, so we did see that in all of the research. I believe Malin saw that as well, where they were like really investigating one eye or the other. Um, when they're looking at their trainer for cues, I think that's a good question. I would assume that they would have probably a side preference. Um, I know that often trainers want them to station and look straight ahead, but maybe if they're trying to understand something, the dolphin, um, I've seen them before working with trainers and turning their head and looking with one eye maybe. Thank so, you. Usually they're under stimulus control then, right? So then maybe they're getting rewarded to look with both eyes at the same time. So that might be different. In our study, everything was not controlled. They were able to swim um, and it was completely up to them whether they looked and with which eye they looked. Thank that you. That? <laughs> that, that leads nicely to one of our other questions. Um, how hard is it to design these experiments? Um, guessing that the dolphins don't always behave the way you expect them to. You think right. you've got a great idea. And well, then... <laughs> so I mentioned a lot of the design we borrow from our developmental psychology friends um, in terms of what they use with nonverbal infants, right? But the problem is maybe the parents or whatever, the infants can sit in a contained high chair or seat or something, right? Whereas, no, we need to come up with ways that they're not being um, controlled by getting a reward of fish for doing these tasks. So you're right. 
in those videos you saw, it's very difficult because social interactions may be more important. So instead of coming to look at that unusual novel hockey helmet I put in front of the window, Juno and Aluark wanted to go off and play and roughhouse together instead of, you know, focusing on that stimulus the whole time. So it is a challenge um, with animals that are not being rewarded for participating in a cognitive task. Um, but in this case, we wanted them to naturally, you know, choose which eye and choose how long they're looking. If we gave them a re reward, they would probably look for a longer period of time. They would stay looking until they got the fish reward. So it is challenging. It depends on what the goals are of the study. Um, some questions in, in dolphin cognition are much easier asked if the animal is getting a reward for um, answering like a, a correct or incorrect response and they can get a fish for the correct or incorrect response. But with our delayed gratification study, they're not, they're getting reinforced whether they're picking the jackpot or the one fish. So in that case, we want to see what their response is, their natural response, again, their preference, um, instead of rewarding them just for, but they, we are giving them more fish. So we want to see if they prefer that bigger reward, that marshmallow, right? <laughs> the extra marshmallow. You know, yeah, I would react differently if it was marshmallows or chocolate. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Either, yeah, name something. Um, this one kind of, we had two questions come in that were quite related to each other. Um, one was kind of broad about whether or not you had any ideas about ecological or evolutionary drivers um, for the results that you found with the species, um, species difference. Oh, the and species that I difference. thought was linked to um, the difference with the lags that since in nature they're found in larger groups might you expect them to be more accustomed to seeing unfamiliar dolphins um, versus the belugas and bottlenose that are found in smaller groups uh, would be less likely to regularly encounter an unfamiliar individual yeah that's a great point so um, initially, we kind of thought that because the cetaceans were similar, that they might have similar um, eye preferences or similar um, gaze durations. But since we didn't find that, um, we do think maybe it has to do with, um, definitely with belugas, they're slower swimming. Um, the way their heads are shaped, they are more likely to rotate and use both eyes. Um, I like the idea, you know, yes, it's quite possible that the Pacific white-sided dolphins, um, the social theory, maybe they are more apt to seeing unfamiliar other individuals than a beluga or a bottlenose dolphin would be. So for sure, I think that it plays into that. And I think um, if it was advantageous, uh, we would have seen maybe all of the individuals having the same exact response but we did mm -hmm. see some individual variation even within species for eye preference. So clearly I think this is an area that, you know, we need to keep investigating because so far the literature um, is not clear cut on what hemisphere of the brain is important when studying cetaceans and their, their social versus their novelty. And so I think there are still more questions to ask. Um, yeah. And going back to the previous question, maybe there's a way to design this where there is more um, experimental control in terms of instead of having the free swim. I don't know. <laughs> Next step. Why, scientists always need to keep keep talking and brainstorming and throwing spaghetti against the wall, right? Um, do you have time for a couple more questions? We have a, a few sure. more that have come in. Um, and anyone who's interested in this laterality discussion in particular, um, if you haven't already seen DCP's work on the crater feeding bottlenose dolphins. Um, we have a scientific paper, an episode of the dolphin pod, and a webinar. So you can pick your favorite um, form of scientific communication and, and learn about that. Um, but back to the questions for Deirdre. Um, have you observed dolphins to have the ability to understand object permanence, like you were testing with your current dog study? So that's what we're also, um, with the violation of expectations, that's what we were trying to, to look at. So do the dolphins, belugas, Pacific white-sided dolphins, do they recognize 
that they expected something to be coming back in front of the current. Um, and when we found those longer gaze durations or longer looking time for the unexpected, then that's what we're publishing right now. So I didn't go into this as much detail, um, but they were able to see or look at these objects or people longer. So they did find it surprising, those events, and they did look longer when we violated their expectations. So the dolphins were able to tell um, in front of the curtain that, oh, I should expect to see that hockey helmet again the next time I swim by, or if I'm actually sitting here waiting. Usually it's a swimming by type thing. And usually it's a, whoa, I see something different there. I thought that this would be there, but now, um, what was actually kind of interesting to the animals was when they expected something to be there and nothing was there. Remember the unexpected control? Um, kind of like with Malin's study where she had the tube and she put an object in the top and then nothing came out the bottom. So with our curtain, they expected an object to maybe be there the next time they swam around, but nothing was there and they were like, whoa, and they were looking. So definitely um, this would support object permanence, this violation of expectation. Um, there are other studies that have looked at object permanence, or at least one or two others in dolphins. Um, and this is just a different way to assess kind of um, that cognitive ability using this paradigm, the violation of expectation paradigm. Lovely. Um, I don't know if um, Kathleen wanted to chime in on that uh, question as well related to object permanence. Sure. I, just a, a quick note that uh, I think it was in 2012 or 13, uh, Dr. Rebecca Singer, who was at, at Georgetown College at the time, in collaboration with DCP at Dolphin Encounters at Blue Lagoon Island, actually studied object permanence um, in the dolphins there. And uh, she used a similar setup with a curtain and um, used the fish bucket that could be moved or not. And some of the dolphins decidedly reacted to the fact that their fish bucket was gone or was there. So uh, it was a it was an interesting. I'll do my my video here. I'll I'll check to see if we have um, uh, the paper. I'm not I'm not sure. I have it. And I was looking for it while you were talking, D, and and I'll see if we can I, find it I or make it. reference to it. Oh, okay, very cool. It was just neat because it was related to similar stuff that, yeah. that you were talking about and and with one of our our field sites. So, Excellent. Cool. We, collaboration, collaboration, collaboration. Yeah, very um, true. We'll end on two kind of fun questions. Um, one, the unfamiliar person at Mystic with the beluga that you showed, um, was that just a guest at the aquarium that day who like got stopped and yes. offered the chance to volunteer? <laughs> no, so yeah, basically all of the unfamiliar humans were visitors to SeaWorld San Antonio or to um, Mystic Aquarium or Shed Aquarium, we just kind of asked them if they were, would they like to participate in scientific research? And some, the majority of the, all of them said yes, and we're super excited. So I think that participation um, in exhibits at aquariums is super important for people getting involved and asking more questions and being more interested maybe in conservation goals. That's a whole nother area I'm interested in. So yes, we asked guests, hey, would you like to participate in our study? And most people jumped at the chance and it was just, um, I don't know, a random guy who I'd never seen before <laughs> who, who said, sure, I'll participate and I'll be in your study. And yeah, so that's how we recruited the guests. Basically, we just went up and asked them if they would like to stand in front of the curtain for a little bit and perform these behaviors. and. Overwhelmingly, the guests loved it, enjoyed the experience, and wanted to ask more and learn more about dolphin behavior, beluga cognition, all of those questions. What a cool, cool opportunity to, to interact with ongoing science. Yeah, that kind of led to other ideas with like how to get more people interacting with exhibits and, and visitors to engage with, um, with exhibits more, I guess. Awesome. And then the last question is, is a little bit putting you on the spot, but a little bit just your own opinion and having fun. Um, what for you was the most surprising outcome of any of these studies that you shared with us today? I guess I would say that um, Dr. Hill and I anticipated there would be more of a clear cut, like eye preference, um, but it still was very 
uh, there wasn't a definite answer to our <laughs> research question yet. So we were a little bit more surprised maybe by the, the individual differences and variations that we saw even within a species. We kind of were thinking, oh, maybe as a group, at the group level, if this is advantageous for survival, we should see this pattern, but we did see a little bit of variation by individual. So I guess that was kind of surprising, um, but not really because we know about dolphin personalities, right? So we know that they have individual personalities and they're able to, you know, be really unique in those aspects. So I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. I don't know if that <laughs> answers the question. <laughs> Awesome. Do things ever turn out exactly how you plan it when you're doing research? I don't know. I think you're always no. kind of a little bit surprised and excited by the outcome. <laughs> the first hour of my day doesn't go the way I plan it. So my scientific <laughs> research certainly doesn't. <laughs> well, fantastic. Thank you everyone for joining us today. And I especially thank you to you, Deirdre. Um, it was an honor to have you and really fun to hear about all of those kind of overlapping studies and different species and collaborations. Um, everybody is shouting into the chat. Thank you. Um, and we look Thank forward you to for having me. continuing our work with you. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Definitely. Thank you.